All right, so uh, I'm very pleased to welcome everyone who has joined us today at the webinar and of course all of those watching us live on Facebook. My name is Violeta Volkov, I'm a first year master's student at the European Humanities University. I'll be taking care of you tonight as a moderator of the event organized by the Department of Social Sciences of the University. Before we begin, let me uh, quickly walk you through a few logistical arrangements. Uh, the webinar will be structured in a way that we shall begin with the session, that, that we will break a couple of times with some questions for the participants, so please be mindful of that. We shall finish with the Q&A at the end, uh, where you'll be able to ask questions or share any observations. Besides, during the lecture as we go on, please feel free to use the chat function and raise any questions that you have. Also, to avoid any background noise, please make sure that the mic is off and we're speaking, but I guess everyone is uh, doing that already, so thank you for this. Uh, that's it in terms of the organizational details. And now, uh, moving on to the topic of today's discussion. As you know, the COVID pandemic has led and is still leading to negative socio-economic implications for the global economies, as well as worsening the living standards of the people globally. And in light of this, financial literacy is becoming more relevant than ever before, as it helps us to make uh, sustainable financial decisions. So within the next hour or so, we'll be discussing the role of financial literacy during the COVID outbreak, we'll cover the concept of financial literacy and how it's related to different economic outcomes. We'll hopefully look at some practical recommendations for us as individuals to make uh, more uh, sustainable uh, financial decisions. Finally, I'm very happy to be joined today by Professor Panu Kalmi of the University of Vasa, Finland, will be delivering a session on financial literacy in times of the COVID. Uh, Professor Kalmi holds a PhD in economics from the Copenhagen Business School with his research interest in financial literacy and how it could be improved by financial education. He's the vice leader of the DG Consumers Research Project and council member of the European Association of Economics Education, but he will probably tell you more about this a bit later. Professor Kalbi, very, very well welcome to you. Uh, on that note, without further ado, I hand it over to you, Professor Pano Kalmi. Pano, over to you. Okay, th thank, thank you, you very you. much, Violeta, and uh, for your very kind, kind words. Uh, so I'll, uh, without further ado, I'll start uh, sharing the presentation. So uh, I hope you can see it fine right now. Um, yeah, we see it fine. Good, yeah. good. So, um, and, and I hope everything will go fine uh, uh, with, with the internet connection, and it, it usually does, uh, but th there was a bit of uh, some, some kind of uh, uh, disturbance, but I, I hope it, it will not, not, not last. So, um, so let's, uh, let's move to the presentation. So this is the outline of the presentation. Um, what is financial literacy? Uh, how can it be measured and improved? Uh, its impact uh, of the of or the impact of the COVID nineteen uh, to consumer behavior and and then the implications of the COVID nineteen to the development of financial literacy, and and as uh, Violetta told told us, um, so my idea would be that uh, we would actually use the uh, the chat function uh, in 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 Zoom. So I have actually prepared a few questions. Um, for you, so if you if you kindly, uh, whenever I I put the questions, I you, you could use the chat to respond them. So uh, so we could have it uh, in interactive in in that way. So this is actually <laughs> this is the warm up exercise. Uh, so I, I I would ask kindly all, all of you participating to to write down what what country you are from and and what is uh, your occupation, whether you are a student or a university professor or or something else. So. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll wait for the answers for for a couple for a while and um, okay. 
Okay, so by now uh, we, we have a mixture of uh, people from uh, Lithuania and, and, and from uh, Belarus and both uh, students and, uh, and, and academics. So um, that's fine. So um, and, and if, you, if you haven't written yet, you can, you can uh, still, still, uh, still do so. So um, good. So I, I have some kind of idea about the the audience and uh, and and there will be a couple of other tasks where I will ask about your country. So um, so I now I know it will be Lithu Lithuania or or Belarus we are talking about. Um, so financial literacy. I, I I thought I will start by a definition. So. Um, so there is actually a very famous paper by, by Anna Maria Lusardi and, and Olivia Mitchell uh, published uh, in 2014 in, in Journal of Economic Literature, which is a kind of, um, uh, it, it, it's a journal by the American Economic Association that actually publishes uh, reviews on, on topical economic issues. And, uh, and, and, and usually the, um, the articles published in, in the Journal of Economic Literature, I mean, they, they have the reputation that they really br bring the most relevant and, and the best um, um, information about the topic. So uh, Anna Maria Lusardi and, and Olivia Mitchell, they, they, they wrote this piece in 2014. And, and it's, it's something I, I would really recommend to you that if you, if you want to know more about this, um, so this is probably the best place to start. Now it's, of course, it's already a few years old, seven years old. Uh, so there has been a lot of research uh, afterwards, but I, I think it's still very valid. And in, in their article, they, uh, they uh, define uh, financial literacy as the ability to process economic information and to make informed decisions about various uh, financial issues. Um, and, and, and this is more or less what, what I, I will follow. I'll, I'll, I'll shortly talk a bit uh, how, how it is usually measured uh, in the literature and, and addressed in empirical studies. Um, also, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the fact that actually now it's a global money week. Uh, so this is actually, it, it, it's a coincidence, but I mean, this is, uh, this is a kind of global event uh, which is happening online, but I mean, it, it has in, uh, in, in, in various, um, in, in, in various um, uh, countries, there are some kind of uh, buy events uh, in, in Finland as well, and, and perhaps in Lithuania. Uh, so, uh, but, but you can get more information by visiting, uh, visiting that website. So, uh, so there is, it's, it's especially about the promoting awareness of financial literacy to, to young people and, and, and promoting uh, discussions about financial issues and, and, and things like this. Um, and and it's it's this week. Um, okay, then you already heard heard a nice presentation from me by Violeta. So, um, uh, but I mean maybe maybe just a couple of points. So um, so I, I I did PhD in economics in Copenhagen Business School now um, almost twenty years ago, and actually. Um, by by that time, I I, I had uh, an interest towards. Um, Eastern Europe and, and transition economies, as it was called uh, at the time. And uh, actually, I did my master thesis comparing the privatization processes in, uh, in Poland and, and Russia. Uh, but my PhD, uh, I actually did uh, on Estonian privatization processes. And I, I lived uh, a year in, in Estonia collecting data. But that, that was like the, the late 1990s. Um, of, of course, um, then, then I, I, I did a lot of things and, uh, and actually I kind of mostly moved uh, to, to other areas and, and not, not working on the eastern part of Europe so much anymore. So, but it's, it's now a great pleasure to, to be, be back, so to speak. And of, of course, uh, I, I have actually in, in the last few years, I have quite frequently, I think about once a year, visited, visited Vilnius and and, and vi visited um, Valdone Daskoviene at the ISM University and, and also uh, the University of Vilnius. And I, I, I really hope back to the time that, um, that it is possible to, to, to visit again. So Vilnius will certainly be in the top of my list. Um, so I, I, 
I worked at the uh, Helsinki School of Economics some 10 years, and now I've almost been 10 years at the University of Vasa uh, as a professor of economics. Then um, a few words about the digi-consumers that uh, Violetta also, also mentioned. So, um, so this is um, a, a consortium of five universities and research institutions. It's actually a large, uh, large project on um, uh, on financial li literacy and financial education to study the issues related to that. Uh, so Uni University of Vasa is one of the participants, but there is also other universities, University of Uvascula and, and Helsinki, which is also my, my alma mater. So I had a first degree from the University of Helsinki and then, then a couple of uh, research institutes as well. Um, then, um, uh, our, our work package is is related especially to the to the use of of games and mobile tools in promoting financial literacy so we are kind of evaluating the effect of uh, gamified methods of education and and also uh, also mob mobile tools uh, in in especially uh, delivering financial education to to young people and and we have actually been actually actively involved in in this, in the sense that we actually been developing as, as one part of our activities, we we actually have been developing a, a game for for financial education for the uh, for the students, uh, the incoming students to the to the university. So it's it's been actually something quite nice and something ra rather different than what what I usually do, which is of course mostly like research and and, and teaching. Um, okay. But but with that maybe I'll I'll, I'll proceed um, in uh, in in this topic and and about the research. So um, so something about uh, financial literacy in in Finland. So I, I I thought that this might be this might be a topic where I will start because also uh, later on a uh, lot of the references I will be um, mentioning are are related to to Finland. Uh, so in Finland, we, we have um, financial literacy at the relatively high level at the interna in international comparison. So this is based partly on, on, on some of my own research with, with, with a colleague and, uh, but also, um, uh, also um, other, other studies like uh, very, very thorough and uh, study by Leona Klapper and Anna Maria Lusardi where, where they actually had uh, I, I guess over 100 countries that they were, they they were comparing, um, and 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 Finland is uh, like like in in the top ten, uh, in in the PISA study of financial literacy where the data was collected in 2018, um, Finland actually scored uh, the second highest uh, of all the countries uh, after after um, after Estonia. Actually, Estonia was the country that received the highest scores in the financial literacy study of the of the OECD OECD PISA um, and and what's more going on uh, in Finland in this regard uh, so there is a brand new national strategy of financial uh, literacy and it's actually it's prepared by the by the national central bank uh, the the bank of Finland um, Okay, and now now comes to the next question to the chat. Uh, so I, I think at at the moment we have probably participants only from Lithuania and Belarus. But uh, but the question to you is that our our financial literacy or personal finance capabilities are 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 they taught in the school system of your country, either in high school or in the in the schools before that? And and do you think that they are taught in in a sufficient way? So I'll, I'll 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 stop for a minute or so to to wait for your answers. Okay. So I I have now the the first answers and uh and, and and you can you can still respond. Uh, uh, so from Lithuania, we have the answer that it's uh, um, that they are taught to a limited extent, but it's it's far from sufficient. And and from Belarus, we have the answer that it's actually formally 
formally not uh, taught in the schools. So, um, right. Um, and and for, for Belarus, uh, there might be um, some classes that are taught, but it's, it's not very regular at all. Okay, so uh, these answers are not, um, okay, and, and there is one, one coming also from the Russian situation and, and there wasn't any, any courses in financial literacy. I think in Finland, it's actually, um, uh, it, it has changed for the better, but also quite recently. So for instance, in Finland at the moment, uh, you actually already in the primary school, so the fourth grade of the primary schools uh, for the kids who are about 10, 10, 11. I mean, that, that's the first time, um, they, they, well, 10, 10 years. I mean, that, that, that's the first time that they will actually encounter these issues. So it, it starts with uh, like economic issues of the family and, and, and what is a salary and, and why, why do the adults need to go to the workplace and, and things like this. And, and, and then it continues and actually uh, in, in the lower secondary, um, which would be like junior high in the United States, I mean, then uh, they, they have some economics and it, it also starts to be like more macroeconomically oriented, but, but also related to personal uh, man issues of personal financial management, like, uh, like bank accounts and, and also like taxation jobs and uh, also from the personal perspective. And of course, because when the students or when, when the pupils encounter this, uh, when, when they are in this um, lower secondary school, then they are about 14, 15, and, and then they start to get already some, uh, some uh, kind of uh, temporary jobs, uh, maybe during the summertime or things like that. So, I mean, they also earned, earned their first money and things like this. And then again into high school, uh, but but actually the importance of financial literacy is all the time reduced and and there is actually not not a topic which is called financial literacy so it's part of the economics and and economics starts to be more about economic structures and and macroeconomic issues so so pers personally i think that also in finland there would be would be more need for for this uh, type of uh, type of issues Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, this is now from the research perspective. So, so we, we, I, I mentioned in the beginning that financial literacy, it, it relates to the knowledge about the financial issues and it also relates to the ability of, uh, of, um, of uh, applying this, this knowledge to, to the everyday life. Um, but how, how it is then studied? So, um, so there is so-called so big three questions. Um, I'll, in the next slide, I'll, I'll show you an example of, of this kind of question. But I mean, this is like uh, multiple, multiple choice questions. Um, um, they are related to inflation, interest rate, and, and risk diversification. So these are regarded like the basic issues that everyone everyone should know uh, to, to be able to, um, to, to deal um, uh, su sufficiently in, in the economy and, and, and management of personal finances. Of course, when there is only three questions, I mean, there, there is the advantage that, I mean, it's actually, um, ac actually quite un uncomplicated to use. So it's, it's easy to add to the questionnaires and, and then you might add them to the questionnaires of, of another types. And, and, and then they can, you, you have actually something to study. So you can, you can look at the relationship between the financial literacy of the respondents and for instance, on the, on the stock market participation. Um, and, and, and this is why they have become very popular. I mean, of course, there are also, um, there are research um, uh, kind of uh, bad, uh, th 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 there is also research where you have used much many more questions. Let, let's say you have research batteries of maybe 10 questions or 15 questions or even 20 questions. But actually in, in the research, it has been found out that these three questions actually capture already quite a lot of variance in what, what we call financial literacy. And of course, I mean, there is the advantage that um, that if, if you, you use a very small group of questions, but they already cover a lot of variation in this area. So, I mean, maybe that already is 
sufficiently capturing the phenomenon and 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 then it becomes easy to use because of course it's easier to add to the survey three questions rather than 15 questions or something like that um in 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 recent years there has also been uh, other type of questions so now there is uh, much more talk about the confidence uh in, in financial issues and the, or the kind of self-efficacy. So uh, how, how, whether the people think that they, what do they think that whether they are financial literate, I mean, or li, li, financially literate. So I mean, uh, how, how confident they are that they, they can do decisions that are the right for them and, and things like that. So this type of questions have or, or also become more common in, in the surveys. Uh, then. Uh, th there is also the so-called OECD approach to, to financial literacy, and, and that actually includes a lot of um, things like attitudes, um, like attitudinal statements. I mean, uh, like I, I, I don't, um, um, whether you um, kind of um, care about tomorrow or, or you might have statements that, I'm, I mean, I, I, I don't really think about tomorrow and um, it, now, now it's the perfect time to spend and, and things like this. I mean, well, th these are literally not the statements, but I mean, but this, this type of statements. And then in the OECD approach, they also ask about various financial behaviors and, and they are also, for the OECD, they are one of the components of uh, financial literacy. Whereas uh, for, for some other researchers, it's actually more, comp common to use the knowledge questions and, and then analyze the relationship between these knowledge questions and different types of uh, financial behaviors. Here is an example of one of these so-called big three questions. So this is, uh, this is the inflation question. Um, so it, it goes like this. Imagine that the interest rate on your savings account is uh, or was 1% per year. Inflation was 2% per year. After one year with this money in, the, in your account, would you be able to buy more than today, exactly the same as today, less than today, don't know, refuse to answer. And as, as you can probably see from here, um, so the in inflation is uh, higher than the nominal interest rate. So it actually means that the real interest rate is negative and actually your savings are losing money. So actually uh, you, you will be able to buy uh, more, uh, sorry, you will be able to buy less with this money in, in a year from now. So, um, so C would be here the, the right answer. Um, but, but the questions are like this. I mean, the interest rate question is also a multiple choice question. The risk diversification question is a multiple choice question. So ba basically it's, it's a use of multiple choice questions and, 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 and then you can analyze uh, the relationship between uh, the number of the correct answers and, and some financial behavior you are interested in. Um, so, so, and, and he, here is examples of, um, of uh, what, what the research has, has found out. So, um, so when, when you, you do a regression analysis and, and you look, for instance, uh, whether people um, with uh, higher financial literacy, so more, correct answers to the type of questions I, I showed, uh, whether, whether they are actually more likely to participate in the, in the stock market. Okay. And, and, and we also, of course, we all know that, I mean, the stock market participation is dependent on a number of things. For instance, uh, I mean, to, to start with the most obvious, I mean, what is your income? What is your wealth? Um, what is uh, your education? Whether you are a male or a female? And, and, and so on. But controlling for all these factors, uh, this research tends to find out that a higher financial literacy is related to the higher stock market participation. It's also related to uh, better retirement planning. So people with higher financial literacy, uh, they, um, they actually um, plan for their retirement uh, more and, um, and, and, and they, they prepare prepare for the retirement, uh, making savings plans and, and things like this. Uh, they are better to avoid uh, problems with high cost debt, debt and, and also other type of debt problems. And um, 
and uh, and also uh, people with um, higher financial literacy, they are less likely to end up being financially fragile, and and this financial fragility is something that um, that uh, I'm actually um, have highlighted here uh, with with bold uh, because I think this is this is an issue that will be uh, actually very important in in the years to come. Um, and um, and and financial fragility. I mean, this is something that is uh, usually asked uh, by the following question. Okay, so how confident are you that you could come up with uh, two thousand dollars? I mean, this is in the U.S. context. In in the euro area, it could be two thousand euros. But in any case, two thousand or or any other number. If an unexpected need arose within next month, okay. In, maybe in the context of Lithuania or in the context of Belarus, I mean, this number can be adjusted, but this is something that they, they have used in the US. Um, and, and this is actually very important because again, of course, it's, it's not the whole story about the diff different kind of financial problems that people might actually end up having, uh, but, um, but it is, uh, but it is a kind of simple measure, and it's it's actually a very powerful measure, and and there is research that, for instance, in the U.S., this uh, financial fragility it increased uh, during and after the financial crisis in 2008, and it actually has been persistent, uh, rather, rather persistent in ever, ever since, and and there is a significant group of uh, of people, more than one third, that actually would would answer. Affirm affirmatively to this this type of the question in the United States, and and the same um, applies maybe maybe in a lower proportion, but in any case, of, uh, significant proportion in in the European Union, for instance. And, and I, actually, this type of the question is also within the OECD question battery. So this is uh, this is something we we can follow. And, and and this OECD questionnaire, at least in some years, it has been conducted in, in Lithuania as well. Um, but and, and here is another measure of financial fragility. This is this is now Finland again. Uh, but just to give an example, I mean how 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 these kind of issues can be measured. So this is payment areas in Finland and payment areas in the in the sense of um, of uh, people having actually a court order of uh, so I mean <laughs> once you stop Paying your bills and and when when you don't pay them even after uh, re receiving a couple of reminders and actually your your debtors will sue you and 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 then you actually can get this kind of payment area from from a court so this is kind of official court enforced and and this is not just that you accidentally forgot to pay your pay your telephone bill or or, or whatever but this is actually that you you have a serious problems I mean. Uh, one person can actually get more, more, more than one payment area. So, so, but you see that the number is like 1.8 million, and and this is actually in the end of 2020 there was uh, I think roughly 400,000 uh, Finnish people who had this payment area. So one person could have something like 4.5 uh, payment area uh, areas in average, uh, but some some had more and maybe some had only one, but. 4.5 in average, but in any case, this is a, this is a very substantial proportion because I mean Finland has only like 5.5 um, million people. I mean it's maybe slightly bigger than Lithuania, but I mean it's quite a bit smaller than Belarus, for instance. So um, and it it means that from the economically active population, when when you uh, well, I mean, the old people can still have payment areas, but anyone under 18 can't because I mean they they are they are not uh, fully um, they can't be fully represented in the courts. But uh, uh, I mean uh, because because they are underage. But uh, but um, but in in the um, in anyway, so all, almost like 10 percent of the the adult population had payment areas, and this is kind of shocking. And, and as you can see, I mean, they actually increased quite a bit in the, especially in the first uh, years of, of the past decade, 2010s. And, and then it has remained quite stable. And now, of course, there is a, 
there is a kind of concern that once this COVID uh, will be, um, I mean, e e even when the kind of pandemic will be over, I mean, the economic repercussions will remain for a long time. Um, so, um, right, okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll move on uh, to discuss a bit about the financial fragility and, and the consumption behavior over the cycle. Um, so um, kind of um, I, I ideally, I mean, uh, people, if, if they would behave rationally, I mean, they, they would probably uh, re react to, the, to these economic cycles in the way that, um, that they would actually try to smooth the consumption over the cycles. And there's actually pretty much evidence that they smooth this uh, consumption over the life cycle. Um, but but also ad adjust to the uh, economic booms and busts as well. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't always conform to the rational model. So I mean, rationally, people would uh, kind of um, ac accumulate some buffer funds uh, when uh, when there is economically good times and and when more people are employed and and when they have higher salaries and and so on. Um, unfortunately, what we often see in, in good times is that um, that actually the, that there is some kind of consumption competitions going on during boom. So people have more disposable income. Um, they buy bigger houses, bigger cars. Uh, well, houses, of course, are not that bad because, I mean, it's, uh, it's a kind of... Um, uh, the, the houses can be used as a, as a security, the mo mortgage loans, and, and I mean, you, you get a kind of good, um, good uh, interest rates and so on. But, uh, but let's say, I mean, like traveling abroad or buying a car, I mean, cars are not that good investment because they, they don't really maintain their values uh, and, and, and so on. So there might be this kind of consumption competitions going on, uh, on during booms, and this might actually lead to an increased use of consumer loans. So what, what we saw in the previous slide, so I mean, for instance, F Finland hasn't been in a severe recession. I mean, the, the growth has been slow, but there hasn't really been a severe recession, recession during the last decade. And, and still you see this kind of increase in the, in the payment areas. And, and it's, it's mostly, almost all of it is due to the, uh, the, the con, con, over, over consumption. Of, of course, it can be due and often is due to various kind of shocks like like divorce or illness or losing a job or something like that. But uh, but uh, but a lot lot of lot of that is also based on on the overconsumption and it's actually made worse by the low interest rate. As uh, as you know, I mean, throughout the actually almost the whole ten past years and especially the five last years. I mean, we we have witnessed a time when. When the interest rates have been exceptionally low, I mean the um, the, the kind of interbank loans have been even um, even below zero and and things like this. So uh, so uh, so this this has of course fueled the consumption quite a bit. Uh, and and then the the other thing here is that I mean often during the economic downturns uh, there is often excess savings. So it's it's also kind of uh, Kind of economic uh, fact that uh, that during the downturns you actually see increases in the savings rates and uh, and this is also something that we have observed now during COVID in in the euro area for instance. Um, the um, let me see. Um, okay, then. Um, then the next next question here is um, what, what what has financial literacy to do all of this? I mean, one of the ideas, of course, is that if if the um, if the people people would be more uh, financially literate, um, they they would actually um, perhaps uh, be use be kind of behaving in more in in this precautionary way. So, uh, so that they, they, they would, for instance, in good times, uh, they would actually accumulate a buffer. They would make investments and, and perhaps sufficiently liquid investments that if, if they got into the trouble, so they could actually, they, they could liquidate these assets and, 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 and that could help them uh, to, to carry over the harder times. So, I mean, 
then, then people would have actually, you, you remember that previous question that uh, how confident are you that you would come up with uh, $2,000 or, or euros um, within a month. So, uh, so then, then you would actually have some kind of savings buffer you could draw on or, or you might have some stocks. You, you could sell uh, in, in the case of personal financial difficulties. But, and, and, and we have also seen that financial literacy is uh, statistically uh, associated with, with uh, indebtedness and the avoidance of the high cost debt and things like this. Uh, but how, how, to promote, uh, how to promote this? So, um, so the most promising avenue in many ways is financial education in schools. And, and this is something we, we also uh, are very much focusing in this digital consumers. Uh, then also this use of games and apps I also mentioned. And, and, and there is actually two strands of research here. So, um, so there is uh, work related to the evaluating uh, existing programs in schools. So this Kaiser and, 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 and Menkhoff 2020, which has been published in Economics of Education Review, they, they give a actually very good overview and, and a meta-analysis uh, on the effects of, uh, of the school-based programs. And, and they tend to find that school-based programs of financial literacy, I mean, they really uh, improve knowledge and, and they also have an effect on, on the behavior. And, and then as this is especially in the US, I mean, there is um, using of the register data to an analyze the impact of financial education uh, on various outcomes like indebtedness. And, and there was a 2016 paper by, by Brown and co-authors in the review of uh, financial studies that actually used a very large register audience and, and they showed that, uh, sorry, they, they used a large register data and, and they showed that uh, actually it, it depending whether whether the persons came from a U.S. Uh, state that actually had financial literacy mandates, so that um, that financial li literacy was a compulsory subject in in that particular state. I mean that was associated with better outcomes. For instance, less problematic debt uh, in 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 the in the future when they were adults. And, and these results were um, later confirmed also by Carly Urban and, and her co-authors, uh, also showing that there is some heterogeneity in this, uh, depending on, uh, on how the, these financial mandates are, are introduced in the, in the particular US states. Um, right, so th this, was, this was the part about the financial literacy. And, and now I'm uh, going to the second part of the presentation, and this will be by COVID-19. Uh, you all know about it, so I don't think I need to say too, too much in the way of introduction. We all have become all, all too familiar with, with this pandemic uh, now uh, already about a year. Uh, and as you know, um, it has had several disruptive effects on various issues. Of course, the health concerns are the primary concerns everything that uh, is associated is kind of follow, follow up on that. Uh, uh, it, it has had uh, effects on education, like, like we were chatting just uh, before this started. I think in all, of, in all of our countries, I mean, for instance, the university education has become online. And in many of the countries, schools have been at least tem temporarily closed. So for instance, in, in Finland now, um, e everything, uh, up, up from the primary schools is, for instance, is now in, in, in a distant mode. So the primary schools at the moment are still open, but, uh, but ev everything up, up from that point are, is, is now in distant mode, at, at least for the time being. Um, but but in, in my review here, I focus on economic issues, especially on the impact of incomes, uh, on incomes and consumption. Um, I think the main problem with this uh, with this COVID has been that the uh, impact is extremely unequally divided. So, um, so let's let's say um, this is uh, for many income earners, um, especially for the for the highly educated. I mean, I, I I could I could use myself here as the kind of uh, poster case. So, I mean, 
what has happened to to people like me and 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 others like me here in Finland is that uh, that income has actually remained stable. So the the university have been have been going on uh, as as you well not not as usual. I, I mean, as I said, I mean everything has been on a distant mode. But I I still get each month I get the salary and and there is actually because everything has been going smoothly smoothly enough I would say. So I mean there is no really danger of layoffs and and in that way universities can can contain their uh, they 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 can uh, be be open and 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 whereas consumption is actually for for many people it has actually been reduced so for for instance traveling has been something that i, I guess we all have been a, forced to cut down and and of course people with higher incomes are usually the ones who travel more so this this has uh, so for instance for many like mid income fin finnish people actually if if you ask what they are saving for i mean the the response is usually that uh, they they are saving for their um, travel to i don't know france or spain or wherever for the ne next uh, summer or vacation or something like that so uh, and and this has not been able to people haven't been able to do that so there has been important savings and then of course eating out in restaurants uh, th things like these i mean have have reduced quite a bit so th there has been and, and maybe using some like personal services like hairdressers and things like this so there there has actually been a lot of possibilities to 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 uh, to save so as as a result of this decreased consumption but the stable incomes uh, there has been an increase in savings. So many people have seen this. But then for many other people, I mean, the downside of this is that, I mean, especially in those services I mentioned, like in restaurants or, or hairdressers or, or travel agencies or, or, or things like this, I mean, the, the, the demand for the services have, have went down really drastically. Um, and, and especially in jobs with close, physical contact like like waiters in restaurants or or hairdressers i mean the job situation has been deteriorated many people have lost their jobs maybe temporarily maybe for a longer time um and and especially if many many of these people are uh like uh like low, lower income people like like waiters um uh consumption doesn't react uh, to the same extent because to start with, maybe these people didn't travel so much. Uh, maybe they didn't go out to the restaurants to eat or things like this. So the the consumption consisted largely of necessi necess necessary consumption, necessities, and 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 of course, I mean, <laughs> there, there is a pandemic. You you still need to eat, and and you might still need to drive your to your working place for instance so you you consume uh, you consume fuel you you have all the housing related expenses and things like this so the necessary expenses uh, have have remained and the luxury expenses have been have been decreasing uh, but i mean but this decreases in the luxury uh, kind of consumption of course it affects more people who are higher income so this is this is one reason why there has been this heterogeneity and, and this unequal impact and, uh, and and perhaps unfortunately one of the results has been that uh, it has actually in increased inequalities in people's uh, possibilities to save or 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 has forced some people to take additional debt so there has actually been a lot of empirical analysis in this uh, so there is a couple of papers referred Anderson et al for Denmark and, and then there is a UK paper uh, but but there is more and, and and they are all telling more or less the same same story um, okay and, and now now another chat <laughs> I thought that I had already been talking for a while uh, so a question what type of economic effects have you observed in the life or people like in the lives of people near you I mean you, you of course you don't need to and so very personally, but I mean, just in, in rough terms, I mean, it, have, have you witnessed anything like, like this, what I, I mentioned uh, or what, what um, okay. Okay, th thank you for attending. So, um, but, but please, if, if you can, can write some, at least some of you could write me some answers. So what, what kind of economic effects have you observed of, 
of uh, this um, this uh, COVID pandemic. I, I, either people around you or other other people you know, yeah. So inequality, in, income growth uh, reduction, yes. So I, I, I guess this has been the case in in Lithuania, as as well. I mean, as we have observed, it, it would be interesting to see. I mean, also to hear what what it has been like in 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 Belarus. I mean, what has been the the implications of of in 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 Belarus. Okay, so many many people have lost their jobs. Um, okay, so Belarus has not introduced a lockdown that there have not been large scale implications for the economy. That's actually quite interesting, but there, there is also kind of economic research about this issue. And and you know, um, you, you, you know, there has been a lot of debate also in the sense that um, that that there has been this reduction in consumption and and. So some of, some of that has been due to the reduction of in income, uh, but then some of that has been due to consumer behaviors. Some of that has been due to the lockdown. So for instance, um, in Finland, now now the rest, restaurants are again restricted. And, and a year ago, I mean, restaurants needed to close and, and things like this. But then even at the times when restaurants have been open and, and there has been no restrictions, actually what you have observed is, uh, that uh, people go less to restaurants. And, and one reason for this is kind of fear to get this, uh, this virus for, from a restaurant. Uh, and, and people are much more cautious and careful. So, I mean, lock, lockdown has an effect, but it, it, it's, it's not all. I mean, even without the lockdowns, I mean, pe people behave in a different way and, and they reduce consumption, especially in, in situations where there is a higher likelihood of of getting the virus, like like going to the restaurants um, and or, or taking the bus. Of course, restaurants are also different. So if you go to eat with your family, I mean, then the danger might not be that much. If if you go in a bar or a nightclub, I mean, then the danger of the contagion is already much much bigger. Um, okay, um, so the Belarus was also impacted, by, although the neighboring state. Uh, close their economies so um, yeah but I, 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 I think this this is still this universal and, and also based on your answers I, I I see that much much of the same things have been happening in in, in, in both Lithuania and, and, and Belarus um, which is something I kind of expected as well um, how, how are these two things related then um, so um, uh, so there is, I think there is yet relatively little research on the topic. I mean, as I said, there has been a lot of research on the consumption effect of, of COVID. Um, and um, there, there is some, some research related to financial literacy. So for instance, there, there, there is a paper uh, in Applied Economics Letters uh, from Japan, Fujiki, that uh, demand for remote financial advice and the use of contactless card payments have increased, right? Uh, and and this, these are probably both issues that require high, higher financial literacy, um, but, but this is also kind of behavioral response that people try to avoid contacts. Uh, but this is probably something that will remain. So like, like the using of these uh, contactless card payments, uh, I, I don't know how common it is in your countries, but uh, in, in Finland, it's now very common that, I mean, especially during this pandemic, I mean, Already for some years, we, we had this uh, system that you, you had these chips in the cards and, and you could just show it to, to the reader and you don't actually need to uh, punch down any, any pin numbers or anything like that. But now in pandemic, I mean, everyone starts to use them. And also financial advice, I mean, in, in, still not that long time ago, I mean, you, you always needed to go to the bank to talk with the advisor or if, if you wanted to 
to to borrow money to take a loan uh you 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 actually needed to go to the bank and now of course the banks have already already also uh started to introduce uh ways that uh, we could have like a zoom meeting and and i i first personally i kind of applied for a loan uh last year and i i didn't set a foot in into the bank so everything was done online but this is this is even in finland this is something that really started uh like like during this pandemic so um so and and this is something but this is again it's very unequal and i i guess it to the extent that this might be happening in belarus or or in lithuania i i think it's also something that is creating inequalities because people have different access to the to the online uh, services and, and and not everyone maybe has a computer at home or maybe not everyone has as a wi-fi connection or or an internet connection so um and or, or pe- people might differ in their skills to use these online services so even in finland i mean especially older people uh often don't have as as good capabilities in in using the online services uh at least in finland there has been a considerable declining of cash i mean this is something we have been talking already for some years but i i think pandemic is is kind of really really doing this so i mean people rarely use cash anymore so every almost everything is card based and and this actually creates a problems of of its own because it's it's also been shown in other research that actually if if you just use um cards in your payment i mean you can buy more impulsively i mean if you use cash you are somehow constrained to the cash you have in your wallet and and maybe you ex- exercise better judgment but but now we, now we actually have moved into almost completely cashless society so uh and and this might have Im- implications to the consumption um then there is some finnish research that by by vilska et al i mean this is something we have than in digital consumers that actually much of the consu- consumption has been channeled via the digital retail so people uh, buy even their food uh, on online and then it's de- de- delivered at the home of of course many people still go to the shops and I, i go to the shops but i mean but this is an alternative i mean especially in in bigger places like helsinki i mean it it's become really common to to order this uh, your your grocery uh shopping to do them online uh and and people stay more home so there there are also some businesses that actually flourish like home electronics or home improvement and things like this um and and then almost certainly the the role of the financial buffers i mentioned i mean buffers in the sense that you you actually accumulate money and and you keep some spare funds in very liquid form uh to to cope with uh with some kind of unexpected uh expenses so that you don't need to take these uh high high uh interest rate loans uh so the role of the buffers have has re- been increased and uh and and there has been research to that effect as well um then actually another other very I- interesting uh issue here and and if if you have any comments i mean i, I don't have now a question to the chat but i mean we can we can discuss this afterwards i'm i'm almost at the end so i mean the the role of the government involvement and of course this is this is something that might actually differ so uh, so i of course like like in 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 belarus there is very strong government control of everything as i understand and uh, and in in lithuania the situation might again be different uh but actually in many countries uh even in in the western world as well uh in in finland and even places like the us i mean uh there has been very heavy government intervention so for instance um in 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 the, in the us i mean even under the trump administration i mean you probably have heard about this that they they were sending checks to every us citizens and and try to maintain the consumption in that way and and now now the biden administration is uh is uh, is planning even even for a bigger bigger program so um and 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 the same same happens everywhere so companies are are kind of supported especially in this uh kind of industries which have been most badly hit um and of course all of this will be like um like like uh it 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 will have uh it will have an effect so government indebtedness will increase 
At the same time, the household saving rates are increasing at the moment. Uh, uh, but this, this might put a pressure on various government social programs, for instance. So, uh, so I mean, when, when the government uh, becomes more indebted, it also becomes more constrained. Uh, and, and this might actually have, have a kind of effect on the social spending in, 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 in the future. Uh, educational funding, so in the universities, we are concerned that what, what the, uh, what the um, um, kind of uh, ed, 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 the future for the education might be, um, whether, whether the university funding will be cut down, and, and then quite importantly, pensions. So I mean, so, it, it, so even before the pandemic, there has been some discussion about the uh, feasibility of the pension system and whether they will be, whether, whether the fun, funding is in a sustainable basis. Uh, now, when the government be, will become more indebted, I mean, it, there, there is in, in Finland and in other countries kind of concerns uh, how, how the system will be managed. And, and in, in Finland, I mean, there is actually a kind of private, uh, save, well, I mean, kind of compulsory private pension savings uh, in, in a big role. And, uh, but there is also questions about their sustainability. So. Um, um, and and then the, all of this increased uncertainty is likely to be reflected in stock market volatility. Perhaps now, now one of the biggest surprises is that after the initial downfall in stock prices, actually there has been a kind of uh, very strong stock market performance that many people have been surprised about. And of course, there has been a lot of discussion whether whether this boom is sustainable or not. Uh, it's it's always hard to say when when there is a kind of uh, bubble in the stock market and I also re refrain from making predictions about that but uh, but but I, I guess they could be reasonably a kind of prediction that the volatility at least could be could be increased uh, because there is so much uncertainty in, in, in the future so so all of this uh, actually um, mm, okay I had two, two slides more. So what, what, what all of this means is that um, for financial literacy, so uh, certainly digital skills have become an essential component. Uh, so at, at, at least in Finland, and it would be interesting to hear how, how you think in your countries, but, uh, but I mean, to be really like a capable uh, actor in, in dealing, dealing with banks and, and things like this, uh, it has really become important to possess enough digital skills that you can actually, you, you can make these transactions digitally. Um, I, I said the demise of cash is likely to be hastened in Finland. So, uh, so the use of cash has really been reduced. Um, and, and maybe the need of being like self-reliant instead of relying on government assistance, because I mean, there might be, there might be a kind of uh, in increase in the need of the government assistance. So this has, this has probably increased as well. So, um, so kind of personal level is uh, to revising the budget to taking account the new realities. And as said, at the personal level for many people, the new realities might be better than the old realities when there was less, uh, less possibilities of consumption. And this has taken place already a year or, or more. Uh, many people might have been able to to kind of accumulate substantial savings. So, uh, so this this was something I was saying already very early. E even though I, I couldn't possibly imagine that this will take as long as it has taken, but I mean this was something I, I I was saying already very early on that I mean this might be for many people a good good possibility to accumulate some some savings and the savings buffer. Um, then. Diversification is always a good advice. Uh, so I mean, uh, so there is a lot of uncertainty in the stock market. So I think I think it's still advisable to to save it to the stock market. But if there is some other possibilities, uh, like like housing or or some other assets, you could you could divest into. I mean that that could poss possibly be be quite prudent. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, learning to utilizing all these financial applications and other mo mobile devices in managing personal finances. I think this is something which is a good advice, uh, ir ir irrespective of the of the age and 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 so on. So, 
So there is a lot of, and, and of course there are many useful advices, uh, sorry, many, many useful applications like, uh, like budget applications and, and applications that actually help in, in tracking the spending or, or things like this. So, um, and, and, and this is something we are in this Digi Consumers project, we are very, very much uh, looking into. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. I, I think I've now reached the end of my slides, so I could at least for a while I could stop sharing. I can, I can also um, go go back if if you have anything specific to ask. But uh, but I'm I'm really now happy to answer any comments or questions. So I'll I'll uh, hand it over back to Violeta again. Thank you very much, Pano, for such an insightful presentation. You've basically managed to cover both the financial literacy aspects, uh, how it relates to COVID, and a personal thing for the last slides on like practical recommendations in terms of becoming a little bit more financially literate. So that's very much appreciated, in particular in times of the COVID. Uh, so now we are moving to the last session, the Q&A questions and answers. So uh, please feel free to shoot your questions at us, either using chat or by turning on your mics. And I guess we have one question already. Yeah, I will read it and perhaps Pano will be able to respond. Uh, in your opinion, what are the major impediments for governments to introduce financial literacy programs? Could the reasoning be political, like governments not want people to be more financially literate, because having financially illiterate people is more convenient for certain governments? Well, thank you for this question, and it's, it's a good question, and it's an interesting question. Um, uh, it's, it's also a difficult question, I mean, probably depends a lot. Uh, so I, I, I think at least responsible governments, of course, I mean, they have an interest to, to advance the financial literacy. I, I think one of the reasons has been that, um, that uh, fi financial literacy has been, uh, uh, it's, it's a relatively new issue. So I, I think in Finland, for instance, it has really become topical maybe in the past five years or so. I mean, in the US and UK, it has been, highlighted a bit longer, maybe 10, 15 years, but um, but fin Finlanders was a, a bit of a latecomer, for instance, in this national strategy, but now we are very happy that we we, we, we have one. Um, uh, so I, I, I think responsible government certainly would would see uh, that um, that people would be financially literate. I mean, maybe, maybe for certain kind of governments, this can hold true. So, uh, but I, I would say that for responsible governments, I mean, they, they usually want people to be more financially literate. Okay, thank you very much for responding. Uh, do we have any more questions or comments coming from the participants? Now is the right time. I guess we have. I have a, a question from my side. As you see problems happening with COVID, and probably we can anticipate more problems in the future. Uh, so, do you think financial literacy is the well is the measure that could help in in avoidance of such problems for the future? And to what extent uh, this financial literacy has to be embedded into the society, education, and so on? So, what is your broader understanding of? of help of this uh, uh, topic, not only from research point of view, but okay. from practical policy point of view. Right, thank you for, for this question. Um, so, well, I, I, I would say that um, I, I'm not sure if it's the measure. So, I mean, of course, there are a lot of other things that are important and, uh, and, and, and and of course, it's it's difficult to say what what will make a successful country or a government. So, for instance, there are other issues like trust between people and trust to government and things like this. But but certainly, it's important both at I would say both at the societal level and at the at the level of of the individuals. And and of course, I I think at the, at the societal level, I guess it's um, it, it's it's like the 
the trust between the people and and the trust mm -hmm. to banks and the trust to government that are also kind of important determinants also of financial literacy because often these good things tend to go hand by hand mm -hmm. educational level certainly i mean both at the societal and also at the individual level because of course mm -hmm. one of the empirical uh, observations from the financial literacy uh, studies have been that it's very heavily correlated to with uh, with with education so more educated people are more financially literate maybe maybe more financially literate people also make make the choice of having more education in the in the sense because education usually tends to tends to pay off also financially and and, and of, of course mentally and, and spiritually as well but uh, yeah thank you uh, I was thinking whether it's uh, for uh, for policymakers it might have a twofold uh, uh, effects. One effect is more financially educated people, so it's it's more freedom in the society and a more critical attitude towards uh, many of the decisions, uh, financial decisions that the governments undertaken. And on the other hand, it's more self-sustaining uh, uh, life and. Uh, reduced fragility of mm. populations. So it's the twofold effects and uh, what is more important, it's actually not, not clear properly. That, that's actually a very, very good uh, point you are making, I think, because, um, yeah, because of, of course, th this is actually something we also encounter, uh, for instance, in dealing, dealing with COVID, because I mean, <laughs> It's a very complex issue. People have a lot of divided opinions. What is the best way? And of, of course, you know, for instance, that like cl closing the schools, for instance, that's a that's a good measure if you want to uh, if you want to stop the disease of spreading. But of course, the problem is that that I mean, the especially for the younger kids, I mean, the distance education is problematic, and especially for younger kids coming from. Uh, Poorer, poorer backgrounds or kind of divided families and, and things like this. And, and, and it's a really difficult policy choice. And, and, and then you can actually see that even in Finland, I think there is a discussion that the government is, is kind of trying to keep this uh, discussion a bit limited uh, to, to limit the criticism. And, and there is also a lot of discussion in Finland, I mean, to, to what extent government should be criticized and the health authorities and and the COVID is a very difficult uh, subject because there's all kind of rumors and, and theories and things like this. Um, but I, I think the same could be applied to financial literacy. So, I mean, the more financially literate people would be, I mean, the more they would be likely to be critical of the government fiscal policies, for instance, or things like this. And But I, I, I think it, it might play a role, but I, I would probably say that at, at least in a country like Finland, I, I would say that the the other um, other, other kind of um, force the, is is more important in in the sense that uh, that I, I I think the governments I mean if if, if you talk about people who are actually governing the the country I mean I, I I think they rather have people being financially literate because I mean. Like, like in Finland, I, I guess in Lithuania as well, I mean, no, no matter which is the ruling party or who is in the coalition of the government, I mean, there is always criticism. So, I mean, in, in that sense, I think the politicians in, in countries like Finland and Lithuania, I mean, they, they, they are used to taking criticism and no matter what they do, I mean, whether they do good or bad choices, I mean, they, they will be criticized. But then, of course, for, for a society like Belarus, it, it might be different. I mean, I, I I don't know the situation well enough that I could I could say I mean how it goes and and what is the motivation in there. But uh, but I, I I could say I I could think of that in in less open democracies or less open countries. I mean, this this might be more of an issue. But I I guess less so in Finland or or Lithuania. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I would like to share, if there are no questions to share, that uh, at ISL we started a special program, a uh, study program for teachers in economics. So I'm, I have just joined the program and I am teaching 140 teachers in economics from all Lithuania, from different schools. 
so they are joining on teams and uh, we have discussions and so on and they plan to use uh, uh, the questions from Lusardi and maybe some yeah. others to check what is this financial literacy or at least, at least for them to know that they can be checking this way the financial literacy of the of the children and uh, what yes. are they teaching at schools yes oh thank, thank you for sharing this and and uh, we, we should organize a kind of Zoom meeting, I think, separately on these issues, because I mean, uh, at the University of Vasa, together with another university in, in Finland, Laurea, I mean, we, we are actually also um, engaged in teacher education, and, and it's, it's actually now very good. I mean, as, as you know, Finland is geographically, I mean, not in population, but geographically, it's a very big country. But now, now when we, at this time of the distant education, I mean, it, it's very handy because, I mean, you can have teachers from all over the country and, and they are in Zoom. And uh, so I, I think in years to come, I mean, this is also what we will be doing. I mean, to have this teacher education in, in economics and financial literacy. But it, it would be really nice to to uh, to exchange uh, views on this. And to so. share, you have a lot of experience in Finland yes. in, in, in education in general, including teachers. Well, thank, thank you. But I, I'd, I'd really like to hear about the the Lithuanian experiments as well, mm -hmm. and, and 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 of course, I mean, and I, I, about Belarus, I mean, there there was earlier this uh, in in the, in the chat that uh, that it, it's not taught, so, but I mean, it it would be at at some point it would be nice to see. I mean, whether there would be some possibilities there, and uh, and 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 in the in the teacher training, but. Um, yes. Okay, and unless there are more questions coming, I was just wondering, uh, Panu, you've mentioned this uh, digital consumers research projects you're working on. So, are there any like practical ways for us as the participants uh, to join, to get involved somewhat, or it's just uh, for the four universities involved, as you mentioned, where you're like open to any new newcomers? Um, of of course we are open to newcomers and and we we do um we do work with uh with people uh so in, in in the sense that i mean of course the information about what we are doing and uh and in, in the sense that i mean if 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 there is something you'd like to conduct research in in your country or if you some kind of practical uh ways how to support or or develop financial literacy so i i would really really be very ha happy to discuss further about it and uh, I, I i just uh i i wrote um the the, the, the consumers website and I'll, I'll send my email as well um to those of you who, who don't know it so please feel free to be in 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 contact and i mean of course if, if there is any kind of development or, or research or or educational ideas about financial literacy so I I would be certainly happy to discuss more and uh, and I I can be the contact person. But like really with these digital consumers, we 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 actually um, do have a big group of people. So there is people from education, educational psychology, economists like me, sociology, uh, to 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 name a few. And uh, and it, it, it's the idea is to be kind of kind of network. So I mean. So certainly we would be very very happy to 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 hear from you okay great thank you very much for sharing the details we'll see where it could get us uh, so unless there are any more uh questions coming and this is basically the last call for questions i think no okay okay there is one more question coming perfect over to you then or you know, I guess no, that was the last, that was like saying goodbye. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, I guess we can just uh, call it a day. Uh, I wish to thank, first of all, uh, Panu, you for delivering the very useful and insightful presentation tonight. I am confident that um, we got a little bit more like financially literate. And now as we have the details, your contact details, perhaps we could explore ways of, you know, networking further and see where it could get us. I also want to thank all the participants who are with us on Zoom and those who are watching us on Facebook. Thank you for allocating time.